pleasure for me to be able to interview you about the significance of the Alma Ata Declaration. It's 40 mm -hmm. years now and Medicos Mundi is organizing a symposium in, uh, on the 7th of November on the topic of Alma Ata and the way forward to, to reach the goals of the SDGs. And for this I would like to interview you, Dr. Francisco Zangan. You used to be the Minister of Health of Mozambique from 2000 and 2004. In a Lancet article published in 2006, you were called the champion of maternal and child health when you took over as director of the new partnership of, newborn, of maternal, newborn and child health, the PMMCH. Mm -hmm. Francisco, during your work as a health professional, including when you were Minister of Health. What was your experience with implementing the Alma-Ata principles and ensuring primary health care for all? Uh, th thank you, Karina. Uh, it's my pleasure to participate in this process. I think it's uh, a very good initiative to bring back the Alma-Ata agenda. I think that has been a fundamental moment uh, in the history of health throughout the world. Uh, it was labeled then as a start of a revolution in 1978. In fact, it was a revolution in the way people thought about health. Until Alma Atta, it was pretty much concentrated on the medical aspect, the clinical aspects per se. All the rest that surrounds the well being of the people were not considered. It were the first time where uh, what had been written in the constitution of WHO in 1948 was, bring, uh, uh, was brought to, uh, to bear the main message that health is not just absence of disease, it's of a whole well-being of the people. And that was transmitted and was captured at the Alma Ata Declaration. It was the first time where there was an attempt to really put that in practice and to break the walls of the hospitals, of the clinical institutions, and look outside and realize that the well being of the people start from the place where they were born, where they live, where they work, where they study, what they do throughout the day and not when they get into the hospital. I think that was remarkable. Mm -hmm. and, and that never moved away. It has been twisted, reshaped, but the notion of the holistic approach is still there. Even today, the motto WHO has, Dr. Tedros brought that motto, carried on from Margaret Chan, and the universal health coverage. That is exactly what the Alma Atta Declaration has stated. It's a matter of renewing the call and put it in a modern way to try to adjust to the current context. But in, in bottom line, what universal health coverage calls for is exactly the same what Alma Atta called for. So just a bit of a long introduction to really a, but bring the point of the importance of the Alma Ata Declaration. We should not let this die. Um, and uh, I was privileged uh, to participate in this process in person. The declaration was in 1978. I graduated in December 1978 as a medical doctor. And in January 79, I was on the field working as a medical doctor addressing the primary health care. I tended to tell people that professionally I was born into primary health care because when the declaration was passed, uh, Mozambique uh, uh, had got independence in 1975 and the health policies of Mozambique were pretty much in line with what was put on the Alma Declaration the holistic approach, emphasis on prevention, 
and addressing the inequities and expand the health network and uh, train people in order to cover those who had been neglected for a long time. That was the message. And we were so enthusiastic when I graduated and I went into the field to really address the policy issues captured in the Amata Declaration. The other element that is extremely important that I lived through Amata from the start is that in my final years as a medical student, uh, 76, 77, and 78, we were asked by the Minister of Health. At that time, in Mozambique, after independence, many people disappeared in terms of the cadres, uh, the technical people for fear about what would happen in Mozambique. So it, it was a dramatic situation of lack of resources, particularly human resources with the technical skills. In our last three years in the medical school, we were asked by the Minister of Health uh, to help three times a week in the ministry to develop documents, to prepare uh, technical material. And that was a magnificent opportunity. Uh, I wish all medical schools could give this kind of chance to their students. So by being there three times a week, three afternoons a week, and being invited to attend the meetings, the National Coordinating Council meeting where you had all the provincial directors, all the heads of uh, main health programs nationally and at the provincial level assembled in one place. And you hear the description of the issues province by province, program by program, and you hear the responses from the Minister of Health. It was an important learning process for us. So when we went to the field to work, as medical doctors in 1979, we knew the policies. We were not there to try to find out what this policy says, what we should be doing about this and that. The other element which is important to emphasize uh, why we were so enthusiastic and we were a really active people in implementing alma Ata in the case of Mozambique. In, in addition, to having students participating in policy design and attending this important meeting in the Ministry of Health, uh, the holiday periods, the summer holiday, the break from one year to the next, instead of going away for holidays and enjoy ourselves, uh, the Ministry of Health asked the university to institute what was called uh, rural activities during the holiday of the medical students. What that meant? It meant to go to a district in a rural area with two or three uh, professors who are well acquainted with the reality in the field and see and work there with the team during one month, one month and a half, to see what it means, what it feels like implementing the program. What are the practicalities you are faced with when you go about implementing the programs in the field? The reality of lack of water, lack of electricity, but still you had to cope with the situation. The long distances, the breakdown of the vehicles, the difficulties of the road to send the commodities to those places. We lived through that while medical students through these holiday activities. That another complement. So when we finished, we graduated, we were well within the process, we knew the policies, we knew what was expecting us, what was expected from us. So the enthusiasm was so great that we were there to implement. And that enthusiasm played an important role. We really implemented the activities in the district and Mozambique was quoted, even the late Hafdan Mala in his interview when uh, uh, for the occasion of the 30 years of uh, uh, Alma Ata, he cited Mozambique as one of the examples in terms of implementation of primary health care. When the interviewer asked him 
about the failure of uh, Alma Ata, and then he addressed the issue of cherry picking that happened when uh, some groups say, no, let, let us get selective primary health care, not the holistic primary health care. And then he said, some countries did dare to implement the primary health care globally. And he mentioned the example of Mozambique. And uh, that ingredient of having people in the field well informed about the policies with this enthusiasm of really going there and make the difference, I think that is important. Mm -hmm. I would link this with one element that is extremely important and was recalled in 2008 on the World Health Report about the 30 years of Alma Alta. Leadership is key in terms of implementing the, uh, the Alma Alta. And that leadership was there in the Ministry of Health and it was what it was, the leadership that fueled the enthusiasm we had and we implemented it. That the first years. Yeah. And as a Minister of Health, how did you uh, go about uh, in implementing Alma Ata? Okay, as a Minister of Health, because otherwise it's good that he stopped me. Otherwise, oh, I would go on and <laughs> to tell me about the whole story. Yeah, you but, have so much knowledge. This is fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, as a Minister of Health, when I was appointed a, a Minister of Health in, in 2000, we were facing uh, a situation of recovery from a highly destructive civil war. If you recall, Mozambique went through 16 years of civil war, which caused much damage. And we had a peace um, accord in 1992 and the first election in 1994. And the process of reconstruction uh, started. I mean, to rebuild the whole system, the whole network which had been destroyed. So when I... Uh, 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 ascended to Minister of Health in 2000, we were in amidst that process of reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And to reconstruct uh, a health network and to, to restate the policies in a torn society is not easy. No, that must be there, there, were, there, were, there were problems everywhere. Mm -hmm. You still had groups of people, com entire community still trying to settle, were living in some sort of uh, settlements which were temporary but not fully back integrated in, where, in their original community. Yes. So that process is extremely complicated because you needed to get people completely settled before you really started to implement a program. As you know very well, the community link in the implementation of primary health care is critical. With, with the people on the move, it's not easy to do that. You can try, but it's not easy. Yeah. Nevertheless, we did our best and we focused on taking the primary health care to the next level. We had made major advances in the 80s in, in, in Mozambique. And we had extended the coverage of, uh, in terms of health network access to healthcare, but still we had problems in terms of quality, uh, the supply chain, and ensuring that everyone could get access to quality of care. And two problems we had. Uh, one, infrastructure, as I said, health institution, health, health centers, district hospital, and rural hospital. And other one extremely critical, manpower, human resources. You expanded the network, you put the services there, you needed to get people who are skilled in order to deliver those services. And so we focused on these two, uh, three, two elements, uh, the rebuild the network to expand it, to reach the hardest to reach and get the people trained and train them in, uh, a way that will not waste too much time to have the people in place uh, uh, to deliver the services. You alluded to the importance of maternal health care. Uh, that's most of my uh, life uh, from the 
third year of practice, the first two, three years I spent in a district doing the management of uh, programs at the district level, at the rural level. But for my third year, I dedicated to maternal and child health, mostly obstetrics. And then you, one of the major causes of maternal mortality may, is hemorrhage. But if you take this big group of hemorrhage, could it be ruptured uterus, could it be a bruxial placenta, could it be placenta previa. But to deal with all these entities which could be bundled as in, in, in the class of hemorrhage, you need the proper skills, you need the people who are trained. To avoid ruptured uterus, you have to know how to do cesarean section. You had to know. You had. To, you have to know how to use forceps, how to use even tools, and other uh, uh, techniques you can use to avoid the process that could progress until the rupture of uterus. And then we we didn't have enough doctors to do that. Even the doctors we had uh, were trained as generalists, not to practice surgery. Even if we have a doctor in a district who is a very good doctor to take care of uh, general medicine, he would not do the cesarean section because he was not trained to do the cesarean section. Even to handle an extremely complicated delivery, he was not fully trained for that. So what do we need? Manpower, let us be pragmatic. We took the assistant medical officers, we trained them through three years of training, including theory and practice, in order to uh, perform the life-saving interventions, mostly in the area of obstetrics, but also in other areas as well, because the assistant medical officers who were trained uh, to perform surgery, we call them technical cirurgia, they were trained to handle cesarean section, ruptured uterus, peritonitis, uh, hemorrhage uh, uh, for any uh, reason, broken legs. They were able to do the emergency surgery and to prepare the patient for transfer in a better condition to be taken care of in a higher level uh, institution. So we did that. Yeah, that is fantastic. I really admire all these women out there who have so little um, care or so little health care and after my own birth or my own um, mm -hmm. experience at the hospital, I think I, I really needed the, the, the doctor. I was nearly having a cesarean section and I was able to avoid it. And I'm sure out there I would have been quite lost. So yeah, I really admire absolutely. all these women yeah. who have, uh, have to mm -hmm. go under uh, this or have to experience uh, such childbirth with so little help. So this is really fantastic. All the help we, we can get. This is yeah. um, so we did that, and then we, those people performed very well. Even the surgeons. There were some surgeons who were reluctant. They said, "Wow, oh, what are you doing? You wanted to train uh, uh, assistant medical officers to do surgery." That's the job of the doctors. I said, okay, where are the doctors? Even if you turn the doctor, you put him there in the district, he will not be there. So we need the people who know how to do it and to do it with the quality, effectively and safely, and to be there where they are needed. And that was a major response. Even the surgeon who was skeptical realized that those people saved the life and they would prepare the patient to refer them to the central hospital in a much better condition that, uh, that uh, happened before. So, and there are many uh, papers written about this uh, to show that the quality of work done by assisted medical officers trained in surgery is not different from what the surgeon or the obstetrician would do in terms of cesarean section, peritonitis, and so forth. So that was vindicated, and the people were reassured that in terms of quality, safety, there is no problem. And this was taken up by neighboring countries, Malawi, Tanzania. They did a, a similar thing with a similar success. So it, we did it because it was a pragmatic decision, as I said. 
is not a matter of saying, okay, we're going to stick with the assistant medical officer, we stop there. As we train them, we increase the training of the people in the medical school. We increase the intake. And we design the programs to prepare the doctors to handle these situations when they're in the district. And we devised a category we call the generalist, a doctor who will be able to handle all the major issues, including able to perform surgery for the life-saving situations like cesarean section, uh, acute abdomen with uh, blood inside or a broken leg. So he will know how to handle those situations uh, when he is there alone before referring them to the, to the major hospital. And apart from this, we were encouraging the junior doctors who were finishing their cycle of working in a district for two years to enter the specialist training in the areas where we needed the most. And we prioritize obstetric and gynecology, of course, the general surgery, pediatrics, and internal medicine. Those were the major priorities in terms of encouraging the daughter to specialize in this field. So that as we go along, we'll have doctors specializing in these important areas uh, uh, to phase out uh, some, at some point this training of assistant medical officers when we have a sufficient coverage in terms of uh, uh, doctors who are specialized in the different areas to be able to be everywhere whenever they are needed. So these things are put in perspective. It's not that we stop to train the doctors and then we just want to train the assistant medical officers. Both are important and needed. We need a process on how we progress in terms of the number of doctors as we phase out the others and how we integrate them into a new policy as time goes along. So this manpower was an issue. Yeah. Apart, from, apart from, it's not just that we wanted to address the surgery, but the midwives themselves were trained to perform life-saving skills. For instance, manual removal of placenta is a procedure that any midwife who is alone should know how to handle it. Otherwise, you can just watch a woman dying in front of her eyes. When removing the placenta, it will stop the bleeding and then that patient, that woman is not a patient, is a pregnant woman woman who delivered a baby, would go happy with her baby uh, uh, to the home rather than dying just because of uh, uh, lack of removal of the placenta. That's another example. So these are, that are, these are kind of skills which we had to introduce in the scope of work of midwives in, in order to uh, participate in the process of decreasing the mortality and the morbidity uh, of women. The other element also we did, uh, training the nurses as well, just uh, to uh, balance that we did not train people just for surgery, is to uh, train uh, uh, the midwives to handle emergency situations in children. There are no pediatricians to put them everywhere. But if you train properly a, a midwife or a nurse who is experienced in the pediatrics, on how to handle the major emergencies that appear in the pediatrics, they do a great job even at the central hospitals in the cities, not only in the district. We saw it in Beira. Before I went to the ministry, I was, I was in Beira, which is one of the central hospitals in, in Mozambique. Those nurses were trained with the theory, with the practice, proper supervision and supply for the commodities they needed, and they were major success. They made a major difference in the emergency department of pediatrics at the central hospital, let alone what they could do in the district. So this is what we did. The other line we took in terms of recovering and taking the primary health care to the next level is to ensure a proper supply chain, to ensure a proper distribution of medicine. 
And this is another important element. In fact, is one of the eight elements of primary health care. And then we set up a supply system that was that worked from the central level in the ministry, provincial, up to the district, so that the commodities would be there when they are needed. And we set a procurement system for medicines and we devised our list of essential drugs and we revised it periodically in order to ensure that all the essential medicines will not lack where they are needed. And we introduced a system of kits, a box which will put what we consider the essential items to be in that box to be delivered in a health center and for one month. So we knew that if we would deliver that box for one month, that nurse, that assistant medical officer will have sufficient drugs to handle the situation that will arise without a problem. So this is another element. Uh, it's really impressive, all the things you did during your time. I think you should really write a book in order to, to so that all the memories and all the, your experience could be kept. That would Absolutely. Be that, that's, a, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to ask you one more question. So you mentioned it before and um, and still today, I think community participation and intersectorial uh, engagement is the, seems to be the weakest strength in primary health care. And during the Ebola outbreak during 2014, I think we, we had a similar lessons or we were taught a similar lessons again. We need to engage with the community in order to save lives. Mm -hmm. Do you think we learned the lesson and will reinforce the Almata principles in the future uh, or, in order to uh, reach the, the SDG goals? Yeah, uh, it's an important question. And uh, uh, that question has got uh, uh, two parts. The, uh, although the Ebola part you, you address, you, you are touching on the community part of it. Uh, but the, the Ebola part is, 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 is so specific. Maybe I can start from there that uh, uh, definitely Ebola, you need to get the proper involvement, proper liaison with the community, definitely. Yeah. Without the proper liaison with the community, the, the trust between the medical teams, all the health teams and the community, the community leaders is critical in a situation like Ebola. It's critical, it's critical for anything, even vaccination, that seems, seems to be uh, uh, simple. You might get a message out there in the community where the, you talk to the elder here, uh, he, he'll tell you that, oh, I understood, I'll tell my community. But when he goes back there, if he did not get the message right, or if he's suspicious of you, when he goes back to the community, he tells them something different and they will follow what the elder says. So the trust is critical to be part of them and the health teams and the community leaders and the community themselves as the same team is critical. That's important for Ebola. But for Ebola, what happened in West Africa was a major demonstration of a major failure of health systems. The health systems were simply overwhelmed. I wouldn't say overwhelmed, highly overwhelmed, were overridden by Ebola. They were not able to cope. That, that was sad because it has been advocating for many years. Every time, my five years of Minister of Health, I went to so many meetings, this issue, of strengthening of health systems has always been neglected. Even some of the partners did not want to hear about the health systems strengthening. Because well, this is expensive, this is a long time intervention, you need to continue, you will build the health center, you will be the hospital, who's going to get the supplies, who's going to work there, but you need it. Hmm? And that was a demonstration. Hmm. These institutions, this manpower prepared was needed then 
Nepal and they were not there. So the, the Ebola is dramatic. The death toll was high and the speed at which the deaths happened scared everyone. And noticing that the uh, uh, health units were unable to cope, people were, were even more scared. So this was, the, 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 this was a problem at the community level. Uh, so, uh, and without this strong link between the community and the health unit and the, a visible lack of response or overwhelming by the disease uh, of the health units, uh, people doubt it in terms of trust, whether they will trust or not to the health units. And then it was the scared people panicking, running away from wherever they thought that there was Ebola and then fueling the epidemic. The same you think we have learned the lesson now and that we oh. need to uh, take more care about the health system strengthening that we, we not yet. need to put that into place? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Uh, my suggestion, uh, oh, if you can convince uh, groups that can go back to those uh, uh, countries uh, where the Ebola affected most in West Africa, uh, Guinea, Conakry, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and, and, and go there and assess the situation to see whether the health system is stronger now uh, as compared to what it was in, 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 in the Ebola outbreak. Uh, the Ebola was controlled the situation was properly handled at the end after a long time, after a long time. Uh, and then uh, everyone relaxed. When I say everyone in terms of uh, the institutions uh, which are able to put financial support and the other support for the rebuilding of the health system, uh, they did not come to the fore. There was the fund which was proposed by the World Bank uh, uh, president in order to help in emergencies. He ended up alone as World Bank putting the funds there. Uh, the other countries, the countries which were able to put more money there, they did not put mm -hmm. the money. So th this is the scenario. The crisis is over, the situation was handled, and then uh, uh, the attention is diverted to s somewhere else. So what is we, your suggestion to, to overcome that? Uh, well, advocacy is important. Mm -hmm. Advocacy is important. Uh, the role of uh, WHO is the main uh, 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 global health uh, uh, um, institution to recommend actions to uh, direct the, the, the health programs, I think it should continue to work in this process in terms of uh, not only the response, but the advocacy to make sure that the different institutions, particularly the development banks and the bilateral partners who are participating in assistance to the different countries, do take this situation seriously and put the resources which are needed in a sustainable manner, in a predictable manner, and on the long haul. This is not a situation where we're going to read the results after six months, after one year, after two years. We need five, ten years. They have to understand this. And not just say, that we're gonna, we are putting money for HIV, we are putting money for malaria, we are putting money for the we need to put the money to make sure that the system is strong and is sustainable. That's one thing. And that advocacy at this level is critical because often the, the disruptions which are coming from outside do play a role in the country. You can start something in a country and uh, in a sudden there is a new priority and you get the partner saying no, now we don't want to fund this, we want to fund that one. 
if you said, but I need to continue this uh, uh, activity I have started. I need to continue to build my health centers. You not to get the money. Yeah, uh, it, is, and the money will go to what is the priority there. This is the country that has to stop. We have to respect the countries. We have to respect what the countries have planned as the strategy, how they're implementing, and together with them implement that. Uh, uh, what they have decided. I think this is critical. Yeah. So this calls for leadership from within the countries. Yeah, I totally leadership agree. Leadership from within the countries. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for this interview. I think we will have a lot of more debates, especially at the, the, the evening before the, the symposium, where we, where, where we will show uh, a Luta Continua on, uh, a film uh, about Mozambique. I think there will be a lot more uh, opportunities for discussion and also doing the, the, the conference. So we are super excited to have you as one of our special guests okay. during the, the conference and to be able to listen even more and hear more about all your experiences. So mm. thank you so much for this interview. Okay, thank you, thank you. Aluda continua. We, we have to keep pressing and we have to keep our heads up and as I said, countries on the driving seat and the leaders of the country as to show that the direction and the different partners work with them led by the leaders in the country as a common cause thanks a lot for these final words i agree i agree thank you there's still a lot to do aluta continua aluta continua